First of all, good morning, everyone, and thank you for participating in today's exciting webinar, Navigating the Charity Landscape. I am Jenny Tukeski, the Programming and Communications Manager here at the Better Business Bureau Midwest Plains. We are very excited because today is our first initial event in 2024, and we are so glad that you can participate with us on this uh, webinar. We also just wanted to let everybody know that throughout the year, we have some more exciting events planned. So please check them out at bbbinc.org. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. We are very grateful to have Jim Judge with us here today uh, to speak with us regarding navigating charity landscapes, the BBB standards for charitable accountability and more. So without further ado, Jim, it is all yours and welcome. Oh, you're muted. I've got to do that at least once. Okay. Yeah, you know, you're, it's, it's a guarantee. You have to do that in Zoom meetings. So uh, thank you very much, Jenny. I appreciate it. And i um, glad to be here talking a little bit about our charity program and what we do, how to get accredited, uh, the things that we look at and why it's in the best interest of your organization to get accredited. Um, we'll go over uh, quite a bit of those things. And Jenny, am I gonna be moving the slides or? Yeah, you can go ahead. All right. Let me, hold on a second. Um, not, hold on. Am I doing something wrong to have it Here, I'll forward? Do it. I'll just do it for you. There you go. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Just a quick overview of the agenda. I do like this to be uh, interactive. So if you have questions, um, you can, uh, you know, email them in or, or uh, just message them in. I'll address them there. Or you can just jump in and, uh, you know, say, excuse me, and ask, ask whatever question you have, because uh, the goal here is to get you the information that you need and that you want. Um, so welcome and introduction. We kind of did that a little bit already. Um, we'll go over the BBB system, uh, a little bit of information about BBBs in general, and then specifically about the charity side of things, uh, the evaluation process, the standards that we use, and then why our accreditation over other accreditations, because there's a lot of them out there. Uh, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Jenny. Uh, to give you an idea, BBBs are uh, 501c6s. We're uh, similar to the obviously tax exempt nonprofit, but not like a charity, a 501c3. Uh, we're sort of like set up similar to like chambers of commerce would be a way of looking at it. Uh, the charity side, so BBBs do a lot of stuff. We're not a government entity, but we do work closely with them. Uh, we do a lot of things like monitoring advertising, we process complaints, we have mediation services. There's a lot of stuff that we do for consumers. Um, after a problem occurs, we have a ton, even more stuff that we do on the front end to help people avoid these types of scams and situations that could uh, maybe end up being bad for them. Uh, one of the programs that we have is this charity information service, and it's modeled after what we do on a national level with through the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. Uh, the VBB Wise Giving Alliance was created in 2001. It was a merger between uh, the National Charities Information Bureau and uh, the BBB Philanthropic Advisory Service, and it created this, this entity that we know now as the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. They're the ones that come up with our standards. We modeled pretty much everything that we do after how they operate and how they apply standards. Uh, a little bit different on a national level compared to a local level. A lot of times they're dealing with, you know, organizations that are in the seven figures. And there's sometimes when we're looking at organizations that max out revenue wise, $10,000. So a uh, big difference in the types uh, or size of organizations, but the same thing applies. The goal of the standards is a very holistic approach at looking at an organization and getting a big picture of the organization instead of just looking at, well, how much money do they spend on their programs? Because, uh, that's not, that's a tiny bit of the picture. Uh, so that's what our local uh, information service is uh, modeled after. Uh, okay, next slide. So the disclosure process, basically how this works, we are a donor driven service. So if we're getting inquiries into the database, if we're getting hits on reports, 
or people are asking for information about an organization, that's going to start the process. Uh, what starts, or how we start the process, we basically add the organization into the system, and then we have a letters process that we follow. In that letters process, we send out a total of three letters. We give almost two months for a response if you do not reach back out and ask for more time. We are very flexible. Uh, in some situations, if it's if time is of the essence, let's say maybe you're all over the news for something that's not so popular uh, or all over the news for something that maybe is viewed not so good, uh, we probably wouldn't be as lenient because people are asking. We need a time is of the essence. So vast majority of the time, though, if an organization is, hey, we need time because we have to fix these three things, you got it. We'll help you fix them. I'll send you temp templates and examples so you can meet those standards. So my goal here is to get the organization accredited. Uh, we're not going to rubber stamp you, but I'm going to show you the direction you need to go if anything's missing. So basically, the letters process goes, You have we have an interactive online questionnaire, and then we also send a print version that's about two pages. Um, I've, over the years, we started out with this print version 20 years ago, and now we're back to the print version. I, start, I tested it in 2023 all year, and the vast majority of organizations prefer the print version over the online questionnaire. I think it's something to do with the fact that they can look at it in totality and get an idea of exactly what they're going to be submitting and what they need. So they're more comfortable with it. And I, I also think it has something to do with being able to just, you know, set it down, pick it back up and work on it a little bit. So anyway, uh, getting off topic a little bit, but we do have a print version that people like a lot. We have the online version that is also great. Uh, we do, once you submit the information, we put the evaluation together, we send the draft back to you and we say, here's where you're at. You're missing this and this, or you're perfect. It happens sometimes. Um, at that point, we work with the organization on meeting the standards. Uh, pretty flexible on time. Again, if we're working towards meeting standards, we're not going to be, you know, jabbing at every two days saying, you know, fix this, fix this. We know sometimes things take a little time. If it's a board policy that needs to be enacted, sometimes that takes, uh, you know, uh, a board meeting. Um, so we're very flexible as far as that goes. Uh, again, I've been doing this for uh, almost 20 years, and I've run into, I wouldn't say every situation, but a lot of situations. And uh, I think there's never been one we've run into that we haven't been able to understand where the charity is coming from, um, and we can work with them on it. Uh, so that's the disclosure process. It's not as scary as people think. I know initially when you open up everything in the organization to a third party like BBB, uh, especially a third party like BBB that's... Uh, typically known for processing complaints, we're not here to make you look bad. That's not the goal. The goal here is to make you look good. We want people to give to organizations that go above and beyond, and that's what these standards are all about. Uh, so Jenny, you can go to the next one. So the standards for charity accountability, I'm not going to deep, I'm not going to go too deep into these because you all will fall asleep. Uh, there, there's a good amount of information in these for sure. But I, you can tell by looking at them, there's four main sections. We do not, we do not really concentrate on any one thing over another. Uh, the idea is you need to look at the whole organization. Uh, so we do look at governance and oversight. I'll throw you out a few examples just so you have an idea. We want to make sure that everybody on the board is not related. Uh, we want to make sure that the chief executive of the organization who's paid staff um, is also not uh, on the board and paid. Um, treasurer would be another one that we look at if it's compensated. So what we're looking for is for the board to be independent in governing. The board is supposed to represent the general public as uh, the organization is a tax exempt uh, 501c3 entity. Uh, the board is representative of the general public. So we it needs to have independent oversight. It doesn't need to be connected in any way, shape or form to paid staff. That's the gist of it. We also make sure that, that board members are actually attending meetings. I have found this to be kind of helpful to some organizations because they have board members that are really high powered or well known, but, you know, they like their name on a list, but they don't like to come to meetings. Well, yeah, it, this is a way to get them to maybe come to meetings like, hey, you know, you haven't been to a meeting yet this year and, and we're going to get dinged by BBB. So I've had that happen before. Uh, measuring effectiveness. This is pretty straightforward. I kind of grow group this one into the various policies that we look for. 
conflict of interest, CEO performance review, and then measuring effectiveness, of course, is uh, is very vague purposely. We we look to make sure the organization has a method of measuring its effectiveness and that that is, is uh, uh, communicated to the board at least every two years. But we stop at telling you exactly how to do it because we look at food banks, we look at you know, domestic violence organization, we look at animal welfare organization. It's hard for us to give you a framework or an outline that's exact for everybody. Um, but I can certainly, if that is something the organization is interested in or wants to get more information on, I have a ton of, I can, there's a lot of directions I can send you and very specific to types of organizations like food banks, like animal welfare or rescue organizations. Uh, of course, we do look at your finances. That's uh, probably whenever I get uh, calls from reporters, the two questions I get the most, how much money does this, the charity spend uh, uh, or how much goes to the charity, which usually I typically take to mean well, how much goes to programs. And then the the other question is how much does the CEO make? Those are the two things that they ask first. And uh, I think typically your average donor tends to ask similar questions. Uh, we have thresholds for our financial standards, like at least 65% of your expenses need to go to programs. It's not a high mark, uh, but it's it's not a high, we don't put it up real high because we don't want that being the, the only metric people pay attention to. Just because an organization spends 75% of their money on programs doesn't mean they're more effective than one that spends 70. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. So you have to look closer at the organization to really be, to get a good idea. Uh, of uh, you know where they're at, how how well they help, that kind of thing. Some of the other uh, financial stuff: make sure that the organization's not sitting on too much in unrestricted funds. With that being said, we do back out any in uh, I'm sorry, uh, property equipment stuff like that. Uh, very rare do we get an organization that has so much money that they don't meet standard ten. But every once in a while, it does happen, and if that does happen, there's a lot of caveats to it that can be talked through. So uh, that's a general idea of uh, uh, the financial standards. One thing to mention, um, probably one of the only standards that we have that actually costs money is the audit. We require a full gap gas audit uh, over a million dollars in revenue. And um, I think if you're up above that level, typically most organizations are having them already because grant makers are requiring it, funders are requiring it. But if it's something you haven't done uh, in the past and you're up at that revenue level, it's probably a good idea. It's it's great to have that, again, a third party come in and, and just go through everything and give you a good idea of uh, uh, your financial health. And then finally, we look at the solicitation materials, your website, social media. We ask for copies of uh, just examples of some uh, solicitation types like direct mail, uh, special events, flyers, uh, it, if it's the only thing you do, grant applications, but I typically don't ask for tons of grant applications because they're usually really long and um, it's not something that people tend to fudge on too much because, well, you do that and get a reputation, it's not good for future grants. So anyway, uh, that's your overview of the standards that we use and how they're applied. Any questions so far about any of this? Any questions about the standards that we have, how we apply them, anything like that? Okay. Um, Jenny, I think the next four slides are going to be just kind of overviews of these. We can go through them pretty quick. Uh, we will share the slideshow afterwards. So you'll have uh, everything here. We'll also give you some resources at the end where you'll be able to find out where you can go to uh, get everything on these standards. So when we put these standards together on a national level, uh, feedback, it took, it took years. The feedback was from small, medium, large organizations, national ones, local ones, CPAs, attorneys, uh, regulators like you know law enforcement, uh, attorney generals. It, all of that information was kind of gathered up and created these particular standards. Now we're looking at uh, making some changes in the future, but they are a very deep dive in an organization. This isn't just standards that were put together by people that you know, only look at charities and evaluate them for a living. Uh, it's a whole, you know, a lot of people were brought to the table on this. And you can see that a lot of the standards, uh, they just make sense. They're best practices. It's a great way for you to show the organization goes above and beyond, not only in transparency, but in accountability. 
Um, you can go to the next one, Jay. Um, effectiveness, this one, pretty straightforward. You can go to the next one. Uh, finances, quick overview of that. That one's not going to be one that's uh, too confusing for you. Uh, 14, for example, with the budget. I know sometimes organizations will send like a 20-page budget. We're really only looking for projected expenses in your three main program uh, categories. Pro or, uh, Three main expense categories, I'm sorry. Programs, fundraising, admin. Uh, and sometimes charities will come back and say, well, that seems like a lot less information than what I'm giving my board now. And the response is, yeah, you're right, it is. But your board members need to be able to look at financial statements and the budget summary and say, okay, now I know we're adding a program. That's why we're planning on spending more. It's just making it easier for the board to help you in deciphering financials. A lot of times board members are very savvy when it comes to uh, accounting and everything like that on the for-profit side, but maybe not so much on the nonprofit side. So we have to do what we can uh, to make everybody uh, kind of understand the same. Uh, and then you can go to the next one, Jenny. Uh, fundraising informational materials. Basically, is we just want to make sure that the organization is putting their best foot forward and that they're not making any claims that maybe are outlandish. Rarely do we see it, uh, but subjective superlative claims have been something Better Business Bureau has been looking at for over 100 years. It's what we pay attention to because it's what the public sees first. That's what gets your attention. So we're going to pay attention to it as well. So this component in it, oddly enough, is probably the oldest component in, in what we do because the, the whole Better Business Bureau system was, was based on looking at advertising and looking at, uh, at things in the beginning uh, before um, uh, when kind of maybe snake oil salesmen or bad people would come into town selling stuff, uh, they were spotlighted that way in uh in local communities so we continue the trend or uh or the tradition so to speak um next one so why why better business bureau we have a ton of studies you can go to uh, give.org we've been doing studies over the past probably four or five years uh, it's longer than that but the recent ones that i'm referring to within the last five years uh we did a lot of uh polling and surveying of donors in our service areas, just to get an idea of what uh, they wanna see, what's important to them and get feedback so we can better uh, provide reports and information to them. And so we do get a lot of traffic. We get a lot of uh, people that, whether it's through Google or through going through give.org, uh, you can get a ton of information on that give.org site. At the bottom is where you'll find the information on uh, uh, the surveys and things like that that I mentioned. You know, increased fundraising revenue information is included in there on the studies that we did with Baruch College, uh, showing there was a correlation between seal holder status and increased fundraising revenue. I think it was like 13.5% for seal holders. And then it was like almost 10% for, for accredited charities. So organizations that meet all the 20 standards uh, were performing better than organizations that didn't. Uh, other, other reasons why search engine optimization, you know, obviously our seal is a trust mark. It's a, a logo that is very recognized. And so we do get uh, good recognition there. Just the trust in general that you get with Better Business Bureau. I mentioned there's a lot of uh, evaluators that are out there. There's a lot of different ways that you can go about getting your organization accredited. But the question is, especially when you start getting into specific professional accreditations, how much does the average donor actually know? Does the average donor walking down the street know what, you know, this accreditation is, that accreditation is? Mostly the time they don't. I think even people, you know, you've worked in a nonprofit your whole life, go home and your, your family's been with you your whole life, ask ask family members if they if they know what this accreditation means or that accreditation means they're more apt to know it because they're closer to that kind of work but your average person on the street I mean, it's just not well recognized there's there's some that have more market recognition the other than others but bbb certainly has uh, a very high market recognition so i would say probably one of the biggest benefits that you get over other third-party evaluators is to be able to display that seal uh to show that hey, we want to give, or, or if you want to give, this is an organization that's been looked at, you can give to them, you can feel good about it. 
Uh, some of the other, I already mentioned the fact that the, the approach and how we go about the accreditation and the standards that we use uh, kind of puts you head and shoulders above the other ones that are out there. Uh, we're not just looking at a tax form or your audit and and coming up with you know a percentage, well, you're this good or that good. We actually look at specific things. We have benchmarks and they have to be hit. Uh, there's another thing that I have with a problem that I have with some third party evaluators that are out there is that there's no benchmarking. So you could spend 10 percent of your money on programs, which is woefully low and still get a top ranking. That makes no sense to me. Uh, I also kind of have problems with review websites uh, unless they're vetted well, because that's it's really misleading to have a ton of reviews and you don't even know if the reviews are from real people. Or uh, are they all staff that's required to write them? You know, who knows? There's a lot of misinformation on the web. So it's our goal, uh, especially on the charity side, is to get you directed to organizations you know can be uh, trusted. And that's why when you click, when you when you see the BBB logo, you can click on it. It goes directly to your report. You can see exactly how much money they're spending. You can see how, exactly how much money uh, is in reserve. You can see everything. Uh, we break out pie charts on uh where the main uh expenses are at we show how their money comes in uh revenues expenses all that good stuff but it is in a format that's easy to consume uh, i know a lot of times especially even with, with board members opening up an audit or looking at a tax form for a nonprofit when you've never looked at one before is really confusing uh it's not rocket science it, it, you can figure it out but the idea is just to make these reports something you can look at and understand quickly and make a decision because really the research that we've done over the years is donors, they don't want to be bogged down with having to do a bunch of research. They want to say yes or no. Should I give or shouldn't I give? And the idea of the seal is to help them make that decision very quickly without having to uh, dig, get too far into the weeds, so to speak. Uh, so next slide. There's uh, my contact information. You can also use um, charity at bbbinc.org. Uh, I've got a lot of email addresses, so they'll all get to me. Uh, I would also say a great resource for you is give.org. This is uh, BBB Wise Giving Alliance. And uh, again, the survey information that I mentioned, uh, the data collection that we have is, uh, at the, if you scroll to the bottom of their homepage, you'll see a uh, link to all the surveys and, and that data. Uh, you will also see, and I started to mention this, I, I think I lost my train of thought, on the standards themselves, you can get into the standards, you can see how they uh, were created, you can see actually how they're implemented, and then even further, you can get into uh, kind of caveats to the implementation of each standard. Uh, to give you an example of a caveat to the standard, standard eight is that at least 65% of your money needs to go to programs. 65% of expenses need to go to programs. What about startup organizations that uh, having are having a lot of trouble raising money? What about uh, organizations that have a very controversial uh, type mission? There are those out there. And what's what's controversial in the Midwest is not controversial or it might not be controversial on the East Coast or the West Coast. So uh, it all depends on uh, the organization and their where they're at. So we have to apply it uh, depending on the situation. If you have one where, let's say uh, it's um, like a pro-life organization and it's in an area that's not very pro-life, they're going to have more trouble raising money. Uh, so when we start looking at their fundraising percentage, how much they spend to raise money, or we start looking at the program percentages, we do uh, actually look at that and take that into consideration as well. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out there to give you an idea. Not all of these standards are, are exactly black and white. Sometimes there's some gray area in between. And, uh, you know, it's, I think one criticism that we get is that these standards are made for everybody, but the idea is these are best practices. These are nothing that, there is not anything in here that any organization can meet. I've accredited organizations that are, I, I'm worked, I worked on one last year that was, I think, $3,500 in revenue. $3,500 in revenue, and they were able to meet all 20 standards. Um, that's pretty, pretty cool because it took them, only, only thing it took them was a little elbow grease. It took a little time to put policies and things in place. But the best part about this, for at least for me, 
is I get to watch over the next few years and see how they how they do. And I have there's probably a dozen organizations that I've I've watched over the years that I've had this happen with, and uh, they're thriving now. They're doing quite well. And uh, most I can't say all of it's because of BBB, but if you ask them, they will tell you they needed this direction. They needed the framework, and we were able to help there. So I really chalk that up to uh, the standards themselves. So anyway, I'll open it up to any questions or comments or anything like that. Jenny, did I miss anything? Is there anything I needed to touch on? Or? I don't believe so. I guess I have a question in regards to, uh, go ahead, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, Hi, I was wondering, as far as like the startup organizations, what are some of like the foundational, you need to hit these sorts of benchmark markers before you start the BBB accreditation process? Sure. Um, so can you give me a little bit about your, are you talking about an organization you're involved with or you're, you're starting? Yes. yes. Um, okay. So we are a nonprofit apprenticeship intermediary where we focus on five specific populations as far as like disadvantaged workers and those who are often overlooked for good reason by HR departments. Um, and so we just got our 501c3 in May. And so like we are still getting all of the stuff as far as the funding is concerned, the the actual delivery of some of the apprenticeship programs. So I would say that we are well within the very start of the startup phase, but I also know that at a certain point, our donors are going to ask some questions and I would like to be prepared for that. Sure. Uh, if you want to share me your or share with me your email address, uh, mm -hmm. I can send you over some, I'll send you over some templates. What I think for a, a newer organization would be, really good to kind of get framework in place for the you know performance and effectiveness assessment is something you can a lot of organizations have this they call it a strategic plan but they don't really have a, a set policy within you know board policies uh, yeah. but i've i've got some things i can share there that i think is for for starting up is the right direction yeah absolutely thank you all right Anyone else at all? Oh. All right. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your time and your sure. in regards to all of this. Um, we just wanted to let everybody know as well, just in regards to some fun new uh, upcoming events that we have going on uh, next week, February 13th and 15th. We have our webinar on online reviews 101 featuring the review solution. And then on March 6th is uh, the Federal Trade Commission. They have their privacy con uh, webinar. It's an all day event. So go ahead and check that out. And then on April 20th in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, we have our shred event up there. Um, here's my contact information. If you have any additional questions or any programs that you would like to see in the future put on by the Bureau, please reach out and let me know and we'll work on those opportunities for you. Again, I'm Jenny Tukeski, the Programming and Communications Manager here at the Better Business Bureau of Midwest Plains. We thank everybody for taking the time to come and learn about charities and hopefully being able to walk away with some great information. Jim, again, thank you for educating us on all of this and also for everything that you do throughout the year. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And then lastly, we just have a quick survey. If you'd like to go ahead and scan the QR code, uh, we love feedback. We love to always improve and we strive to be the best. So please go ahead and fill that out and we'll go from there with everything. All right. Well, everyone take care. Have a great day. and We hope to see you soon. <laughs>